In 1979, addressing the Pontifical Academy of Sciences gathered to remember Albert Einstein, Pope John Paul II began his reflection by expressing the hope that, in his own words, theologians, scholars, and historians, animated by a spirit of sincere collaboration, will study the Galileo case more deeply and in frank recognition of wrongs, from whatever side they come. People were baffled. Why should a newly elected pope, a Polish pope, who had before him a long list of weighty international issues, feel the need to put such a case on the agenda? True, a case regarding one of the most famous scientists of all time, but still, a case closed 346 years ago. Galileo's condemnation of his abjuration in 1633 left a deep wound in the church. Galileo was caught up in the politics of his day. People forget that for most of his life, he actually was very successful. He had the church endorsing his views. He always got church permission to publish, even the book that he got in trouble with. For what crimes had the Holy Office condemned Galileo in 1633? Urban VIII, who was Pope at the time, did not sign the sentence personally, but he recommended the judge's maximum severity. Why did the man who had now taken his place on the throne of Peter ask in 1979 for the correction of the wrongs committed against the physicist from Pisa? Galileo had been found guilty, according to the judges, of having supported the Copernican theory as scientific truth, rather than presenting it as speculation, which Cardinal Bellarmine of the Sacred Congregation of the Index had ordered him to do in 1616. The judges of the Holy Office would state, the sun is the center of the world and completely devoid of local motion. This proposition is foolish and absurd in philosophy and formally heretical since it explicitly contradicts in many places the sense of holy scripture. The earth is not the center of the world nor motionless, but it moves as a whole and also with diurnal motion. This proposition receives the same judgment in philosophy and that in regard to theological truth it is at least erroneous in faith. In Galileo's case, even if the proceedings were disciplinary, he was still accused by the judges as vehemently suspect of heresy. Not a heretic, but vehemently suspect, because he had supported a theory that had been previously and by a decree of the Index, not of the Holy Office, considered contrary to the Scripture. He was found guilty of something else as well. He had been charged of having fraudulently obtained the imprimatur for his book Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. The sentence stated that the author of the book had not been impartial in his commentary on the two theories and that he clearly had an inclination toward the theory of heliocentrism. In order that his sentence would only be incarceration, which at the end was no more than house arrest, Galileo had to abjure this theory. His only obligation was to recite the seven penitential psalms once a week. So why is this case, a normal inquisitorial process in which the defendant was punished so slightly, never charged with the death penalty, still so relevant for the church of the 20th century? Il caso Galileo, eh, the Galileo case remained as a boulder that has jeopardized the normal relationship between scientific research and the life of faith. We can find a plausible answer in the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes, mentioned by John Paul II in his address of 1979. Galileo was directly mentioned in the summary of the main arguments in a footnote at the end of an article. We cannot but deplore certain habits of mind, which are sometimes found too among Christians which do not sufficiently attend to the rightful independence of science. This is what the Second Vatican Council wanted to point out. To take up Galileo's case meant reconsidering an event that involved not only a scientist, but also those who have made him a tool of anti-clericalism throughout the centuries, those who have made him a champion against the Church's alleged obscurantism. John Paul II talked about Galileo's myth, a myth that has led many to believe that there is an incompatibility of principles between the science and faith. Two different processes are going on in Europe. 
There was the problem of the unification of Italy and the church being opposed to it. The Italian government, which was very anti-clerical, then created this myth that you can't trust the church because it's anti-science. Then they put up the statues to Giordano Bruno and things like that, who nobody had ever noticed before. In America, it was an anti-immigrant kind of politics. There was a group in America who wanted to keep people like me with vowels at the end of their names from coming into America. So again, they started the myth that the church was anti-science. It also came from this real 19th century idea that science is going to solve all of our problems. We don't need the church anymore. This means that Voitia's aim was not a legal review of the case. It was somehow necessary to bring it back to the attention of the people, not through a legal redemption, but through a purification of the memory something John Paul II asked from the church during the Jubilee of 2000. In 1981, a little more than one year after John Paul II's address, a commission took shape, the so-called Galileo Commission. The commission consisted of four working groups to deal with exegetics, general culture, science and epistemology, and history and jurisprudence. There never was anything like a commission intended as a working group directed by one person, with precise goals and an assigned budget. The Commission's study lasted more than 10 years. However, despite the enormous amount of research, it was hard to turn John Paul II's request into a concrete work strategy. It might have been easier to do as Father Coyne, the head of the scientific research group, had suggested, to set some work goals. When, in the 90s, the Galileo Commission finally completed its work, the announcement was given by the one who had first started the operation, the Pope himself, during another address to the Academy of Sciences on October 31, 1992. <laughs> Obliger les théologiens à s'interroger sur leurs propres critères d'interprétation de l'écriture. La plupart n'ont pas su le faire. What did the enormous amount of research really achieve? What did rehabilitation, that word so often used to describe the church's new attitude toward Galileo, really mean? Now, for 250 years, People have been teaching the Galileo, the Copernican theory. And of course, our modern cosmology has gone way beyond anything Copernicus had. The difference was Galileo himself personally had suffered unjustly by the church. And Pope John Paul II wanted to address that personal injustice that had been done to him. The commission never had the task of legally reopening the case. The process concluded in 1633 had been a regular one in the eyes of the Holy Office. However, the Commission admitted some wrongs committed by the judges against Galileo. What wrongs are we talking about? This wound needed to be healed. Modern experimental science was born and raised in the cultural background of Christianity. And anyway, one of the aims pursued by the Galileo Case Study Commission was to go beyond Galileo himself. Comunque uno degli obiettivi che aveva perseguito la commissione di studio del caso Galileo era andare al di là del caso Galileo. What results did this commission achieve? Did it change the relationship between faith and science? How? There are a lot of people who don't know much about the church and don't know much about science who think that Galileo is a symbol of the church hating science. And this was a very specific step they could take, we could take, to show, no, that's not true. We honor Galileo as a wonderful scientist and a wonderful son of the church. 
From the acts, we learn that there was a proposal to draft a protocol that would set out clear guidelines by which to understand the relationship between scientist and theologian in order to avoid more Galileo cases. This document has never been written, but the Church has very clear views on how to observe scientific progress. I think the lesson has been learned. The Council has recognized the autonomy of the ways of Earth, whom the Creator has provided with an order of structure. Therefore, the researcher will do his work trying to find out how nature works. The theologian has absolutely nothing to say about this. He has to learn how to integrate the information obtained through the natural science into a wider design. The first Jubilee of Scientists in history was held May 25, 2000. A new project has also been established, the STOQ, Science, Theology and Ontological Quest. It unites scientists and theologians who wish to discuss matters related to the progress of science and technology in the philosophy and theology classrooms of pontifical universities. Is the Galileo case really closed? What is its legacy? We learned from Galileo. We learned from that mistake. And regardless of how you cut it, what happened to Galileo was a mistake on the part of the church, one that the church needed to apologize for.